the Princess Elizabeth has agreed to accept the crown and rule as Queen. Queen Elizabeth II, the longest reigning monarch in British history. She ascended to the throne and was crowned Queen at the tender age of 27. During her 70-year reign, Her Majesty worked with 15 Prime Ministers, each of whom formed successive governments and steered the country on her behalf. Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II witnessed vast changes over the course of her reign. Prime Ministers came and went, but the late Queen remained steady and dutiful during periods of political turmoil and division. Every expression on my face at this moment may be viewed by millions of people throughout the United States. <laughs> Her Majesty, the Queen, has asked me to form a new administration, and I have accepted. Go on, take your bloody pictures now! Jennifer Nadel now reports on a remarkable Labour victory and what the future holds for the Conservatives. We will govern for the whole of this nation, every single part of it. Marriage is a great institution, and it should be there for people who are gay as well as people who aren't. That's why I've pioneered this change. Do we want 2020 to be another year of defeatism and despair? No, we don't. Get Brexit done. The Queen became a symbol of stability and constancy in a country driven by innovative ideas and transformative policies. In whirlwind periods for British politics, the monarch can only be described as a steady figure of calm and one which many members of the public and government have come to rely on. This is The Queen's Prime Ministers. The Queen's first Prime Minister, Sir Winston Churchill, achieved international respect and a reputation as a wartime hero after the victory in World War II. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on beaches, landing grounds, in fields, in streets, and on the hills. We shall never surrender. Despite his age and health, Churchill became Prime Minister for a second time in 1951. The defeat of his Conservative Party in the 1945 elections caused Sir Winston to retire his head of state to lead the opposition party in the House of Commons. Six years later, public sentiment at the polls was to return the Conservative Party to power, and once again the honored statesman stepped up to the highest executive post of the empire. It was only three months into his second premiership when, to the devastation of many, King George VI died. The king was gravely ill, and even as we watched and waited, the nation prayed. Operation on the king, we read, and knew how ill he was. But success seemed to crown the skill of the surgeon. But now the king is dead. Long live the queen. The rulers of our land meet to welcome the new queen. There too, the Duke of Gloucester, her uncle, and the Lord Chancellor. The Premier and Mr. Attlee, leader of the opposition, are agreed in this great moment of our history. Her tour of the Commonwealth cancelled. The princess we knew as a girl and watched in the even growth of her stature comes back to meet her ministers as Queen 
over the great lands that for 15 years acknowledged her father as head. Now the Princess Elizabeth we knew and loved returns amongst us as our queen. Before her plane, her government and leaders of the other parties receive her greeting. No queen had ever such counselors so predetermined to give of their best. No queen had ever such a people so devoted. Through the long years, she had grown amongst us, one of us. The little girl we knew has become Queen Elizabeth. The love we gave her has become allegiance. He showed little interest at the time in working with the new Queen Elizabeth, referring to her as only a child whom he barely knew. This quickly turned around, however, and he took it upon himself to honor his dear old friend to make sure Elizabeth knew her role, responsibility, and duty as sovereign. The Queen's coronation, perhaps one of the greatest and most memorable events of the century. There was, however, a bone of contention between Churchill and the Queen. She and Prince Philip felt it awfully important to televise the event, whilst Churchill felt this would be most unfitting, but the Queen prevailed and got her wish to have the event broadcast. The nation shared in the ceremony and celebrated the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II. As ever, the Prime Minister's audience with the monarch is kept absolutely confidential. They meet once a week, every week, and there is no record kept of anything said during these meetings. However, those waiting outside have told of times when they would hear roaring laughter coming from the room. It is often said that Churchill would come out of their audience wiping his eyes from tears of laughter. As a new queen, and Churchill her first prime minister, he coached her in many of the intricacies of British party politics, the constitution, and the government. With his many years of wisdom and experience, the queen was enormously grateful for his knowledge and guidance, particularly during those early years as she found her feet. The royal couple proceeded up Broadway, the Canyon of Heroes, bombarded by tons of ticker tape, millions of cheers, and what was the most enthusiastic reception anywhere in Elizabeth's 10-day North American tour. I'm now nearing the end of my journey. I hope I still have some services to render. But in 1955, the advance of time did to Churchill what dictators, armies, and war planes had failed to do. He chose to surrender. Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip attended a formal dinner party at the venerable statesman's residence at 10 Downing Street. Sir Winston had announced the retirement at the age of 81. Churchill resigned as prime minister in 1955 at 80 years of age there remained a member of parliament for several years to come. Both age and poor health meant he was not the man he used to be, 
and much of his work had been conducted from his bedside. Queen Elizabeth wrote a letter to Churchill detailing that no prime minister would be able to hold the place of my first prime minister, to whom both my husband and I owe so much, and for whose wise guidance during the early years of my reign, I shall always be so profoundly grateful. Winston Churchill's ill health and eventual resignation made way for the arrival of Anthony Eden at 10 Downing Street in 1955. Sir Anthony Eden had previously served as Foreign Secretary. However, Eden's favoring of foreign policy would leave him in deep trouble when it came to the Suez Canal crisis. The Suez Canal, lifeline of Europe, in a dramatic sequence of events, became a cause of war. When President Abdul Nasser announced its seizure by Egypt, thrust, Israeli troops struck down the Sinai Peninsula to within a few miles of the canal itself. Within days, Egyptian forces were completely routed. The stage was set for the next move in the complex Suez situation. Britain and France... In 1956, the Egyptian leader Gamal Abdel Nasser nationalized the Suez Canal, which had been jointly run by a British-French organization since 1869. The canal's value to international trade made it an instant source of conflict. British, French and Israeli forces soon struck an armed attack. We make no apology and will never make one for the action which we and our French allies took together. The military intervention proved unsuccessful. The Soviet Union had been supplying arms to the Egyptian government, and the United States issued stern warnings to France, Britain and Israel to withdraw from Egyptian soil. Britain and France bowed down to President Eisenhower's pressure and withdrew troops. The Prime Minister grew close to the Queen supporting the royal family through Princess Margaret's entanglement with Peter Townsend. However, Eden's good relationship with the monarch could not save him from spiraling opinion polls. you know Sir Anthony Eden at the time? Yes, I heard about it. What do you think of it? Well, it's about time they got rid of him. You don't like him? I don't. Personally, don't like him, no. Don't you think he's made a successful job? No, I don't think so. Who do you think succeeded? Oh, it's a bit of a puzzle. Doesn't matter who they put in, I'd... It's a bit of a job, my opinion, anyway. Yes. In the end, the disastrous military conflict became the final blow to Anthony Eden's time in office, and he resigned in 1957. Good evening. This afternoon, the Queen did me the great honour to ask me to form a government. I have accepted this duty. Harold Macmillan replaced Anthony Eden as Prime Minister, leading the country from 1957 until 1963. As the last Prime Minister to be born in the Victorian age, Macmillan had fought in World War I, but suffered from pain and partial mobility for the rest of his life. Macmillan, fondly nicknamed as Super Mac, oversaw an age of affluence with low unemployment and high growth. Macmillan also rebuilt Britain's special relationship with the US after the disastrous Suez Canal crisis and sped up decolonization in Africa. In 1959, he led the Conservative Party to victory in the general election, 
interesting thing about the results we've had so far is that there seems to have been a swing towards Labour in the Labour constituencies and a swing towards Conservatives in the Conservative constituencies. But the swing in the Conservative constituencies is heavier uh, than the other way around in the Labour constituencies, so that on balance, the average swing is towards Conservative. However, another scandal and crisis soon loomed for the pragmatic Prime Minister. The Profumo Affair in 1963 massively damaged Macmillan's government. The revelation of the affair between the Secretary of State for War John Profumo and rumoured call girl Christine Keeler caused much scandal in the press. Ms Keeler, how do you see your future now? Well, I have no immediate plans. I shall either stay here or go back to Madrid. Depends over the couple of months that it'll come. You said when this affair first started that uh, the publicity might have ruined your modelling career. Hasn't it, in fact, been of an advantage to you? Well, I don't know. I haven't um, associated with my modelling agencies, and uh, I will find out that sooner or later. It was also revealed that Keeler was having an affair with a Soviet spy, which threatened the country's security. Mr Macmillan returns to Westminster with exactly a week in which to prepare for the Commons debate on the Profumo case, which the Labour Party has insisted on. He's had ten days' holiday in Scotland, and if the resignation of his Secretary of State for War has cast any uneasiness over the latter half of it, then by all accounts he's, able, he's been able to conceal the uneasiness pretty well. Last night he was able to relax at a barbecue party not far from his favourite golf course at Glen Eagles. Unfortunately, the scandal proved too much for Macmillan, and the Conservative Party once again pushed for their leader to resign. Harold Macmillan left office in 1963, suffering from bad health and the fallout of the Profumo affair. Alec Douglas Home took over as leader of the Conservative Party and Prime Minister after Macmillan's resignation. Douglas Home was a family friend of the Queen Mother's and a peer in the House of Lords. As you already know, I've today been appointed Prime Minister by the Queen. And there are one or two things I would like to say to you at once. First, that my task is to serve the whole nation. Secondly, no one need expect any stunts from me, merely plain, straight talking. And then again, one of the difficulties of our modern times, when events move so fast and all the affairs of government are so complex, is that Whitehall may seem very remote from your home. Well, I want to share all the government thinking with you and want you to understand what the government are doing and why. Queen Elizabeth II worried about suggestions that she had controversially intervened in appointing him to the post of Conservative leader. The monarch even took steps to distance herself from the leadership process by travelling to Windsor. Whatever may be happening in Russia tonight, and the latest news suggests it could be something big, within minutes we shall have a pointer to who's going to govern Britain for maybe the next five years. There is a variation in the swing towards Labour, but it is a distinct, and it looks now, a decisive swing to Labour. Here's the swing indicator for you there. Uh, you can see the hand just adjusting it there from a little bit over five to just below five. Uh, uh, that's about the figure. Alec Douglas Home lasted only a year in office before Labour's success at the 1964 general election. After success at the 1964 general election, the Queen soon found herself facing her first ever Labour Prime Minister, Harold Wilson. Wilson appeared very different from the Queen's previous four Prime Ministers. 
Far from the Etonian nature of Macmillan or Eden, Wilson came from a middle-class background and grew up in Yorkshire. We know that rents have been rising. We, in the Labour government, introduced a measure to control the rise in rents by local councils. The Tory party in the House of Commons voted against it. Anybody deny that? He became famed for smoking a pipe and portraying a quirky everyman image, which went down well with the public. Harold Wilson's government implemented vast changes to social issues and enjoyed success when decriminalizing homosexuality, abolishing the death penalty and legalizing abortion. Well, doesn't it disturb you that the majority of people in this country at the moment seem to be for the death penalty? Oh, no, not at all. Uh the, what I would call, informed opinion is, in my view, overwhelmingly in favor of abolition. The monarch and Wilson enjoyed a relaxed and friendly relationship. It is often reported that Wilson was one of Her Majesty's favorite prime ministers. In 1966, a small mining village in South Wales was met with tragedy. The collapse of a colliery tip killed a total of 116 schoolchildren and 28 adults. Up to the time I came up, which is roughly uh, 15 minutes ago, there were 21. But I'm sorry to say there's still about 110 or 115 or even a few more who still have to be got out. And this is going to take quite a time. Actually. This is a long-term operation. Harold Wilson, Prince Philip and Lord Snowden all visited the scene the following day. However, the Queen was advised by private secretaries to delay her visit, which the public heavily criticised. After encouragement from Wilson, the monarch eventually visited Aberfan eight days after the tragedy struck and offered sympathy to the mourners. Death comes also to the tiny coal mining village of Aberfan in Wales. A mass funeral is held for the 81 children killed when their school was crushed by an avalanche of coal waste. It is said that her delay in reacting to the Aberfan disaster was one of the biggest regrets of her reign. Floral tributes come from all over the world as a village mourns a generation of children. Although ousted at the 1970 general election, Wilson returned to the position of Prime Minister in 1974. Mr. Wilson had intended only to stop and shake hands, but clearly impressed by the turnout, he called for a chair to stand on, took a microphone, and returned to the theme he's repeated most in this campaign. The issues are your family, the issues of your family. You'd like a bit of peace and quiet to live your own life. You don't want to go back to last February, the confrontation, and the unlit streets and the unheated shops and offices, that was the direct result of Tory-inspired conflict with the people of this country. However, two years into his second premiership, he resigned, much to the shock of both the general public and the monarch. Edward Ted Heath led the Conservative Party to another victory in 1970, defeating his rival Harold Wilson. The Queen has asked me to form the next government, and I am indeed proud to accept. To govern is to serve. This government will be at the service of all the people, the whole nation. Heath presided over one of the most difficult eras in the 20th century. Major industrial upheaval and economic decline challenged Heath throughout his premiership. 
In the early 1970s, the power of trade unions had dramatically risen. Calling Battersea Power Station. Support the National Union of Mine Workers. Refuse to handle any call. Call in on all power station workers. Refuse to handle any imported coal. Refuse to handle any oil. We ask for your full support. Heath attempted to weaken their power, but ultimately failed. Unions went out on strike when Heath did not meet their pay demands. And to the trade union leaders, I would say this. Stop the strikes and start the work. Stop chasing wild and unjustifiable wage claims. Start negotiating sound and solid productivity deals. The crippling miners' strikes of 1972 and 1974 caused major turmoil for Heath's government. The second strike in 1974 even led to a three-day working week and blackouts in order to cut back on energy consumption. Heath's premiership was full to the brim of economic problems and social unrest. Ted Heath only lasted one term in office, replaced by Harold Wilson's minority Labour government in 1974. After Wilson's shock resignation in 1976, Labour chose James Callaghan to lead the party and country. Callaghan is the only person to have held all four great offices of state, having served as the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Home Secretary and Foreign Secretary before becoming Prime Minister. Born in Portsmouth, Callaghan came from a working-class family. Despite the differences in background, the Queen and Callaghan enjoyed a very friendly relationship. Callaghan was once quoted saying, she always seems to be able to see the funny side of life. Premiership proved less smooth running. The power of trade unions was still at large, and public sectors, as well as private, opted to strike. In the winter of 1978 and 1979, a wave of strikes rippled across Britain, causing chaos and upheaval. Look, the solution to this problem, and we do, I think, although we've all had a more than a basin full of it this winter. We really have, I and mean, I've been appalled at some of the things that have gone on this winter, and I've kept my, bitten my tongue more than once on this, because I believe in the long run, there's no point in going all out on it. But despite the basin full we've had, the real solution to this is responsibility, and the responsibility by those in the, uh, in the trade union field who are calling their people out. On the whole, it's not the national leaders. The responsibility is much lower down. This period soon became known as the winter of discontent. Higher wages, real wages, not just paper money, must come not from holding the country to ransom, but from raising productivity and reducing restrictive practices. <laughs> In the long run, unions can only prosper when the nation prospers, and vice versa. As a song about love and marriage pointed out, this I tell you, brother, you can't have one without the other. The Conservative leader, Margaret Thatcher, seized the opportunity to criticise the government's handling of the crisis. James Callaghan ultimately lost the election in 1979 and returned to the opposition benches. Her Majesty, 
the Queen has asked me to form a new administration, and I have accepted. Margaret Thatcher, or the Iron Lady, was Queen Elizabeth II's first female prime minister and the first ever woman to hold the position in British history. With two females holding the most powerful positions in the country, a new era dawned in the United Kingdom. Thatcher's policies and ethics later came to be known as Thatcherism, advocating, amongst other things, for greater independence of the individual from the heavy hand of the state. She became a hero for many, announcing a new initiative where tenants could purchase their council-owned homes at a discount up to 70%. To those waiting with bated breath for that favorite media catchphrase, the U-turn, I have only one thing to say. You turn if you want to. <laughs> the ladies not for turning. <laughs> In 1982, Thatcher faced pressing issues overseas. After decades of territorial dispute and with little warning, Argentina invaded sovereign British territory, the Falkland Islands in the South Atlantic. Thatcher formed a war cabinet and dispatched a naval task force to the Falklands. Britain was at war. Britain is not prepared to be pushed around. We have ceased to be a nation in retreat. The commander of the operation has sent the following message. Be pleased to inform Her Majesty that the White Ensign flies alongside the Union Jack in South Georgia. God save the Queen. What happens next, What's Mr. Mr. Nott? Thank you very much. Just What's your rejoice at that news and congratulate our forces and the Marines. Are we going Good to declare war on the Thank you. The victory in the Falklands elevated Margaret Thatcher to the position of national hero and the country's mood was at an all-time high during this period in her premiership. In 1984, however, Thatcher's government came into further conflict with trade unions. The National Coal Board proposed to close 20 state-owned mines and cut 20,000 jobs. Two-thirds of the country's miners, led by Arthur Scargill, protested and went on strike. Thatcher was soon facing another conflict, this time in Britain. Where there is discord, may we bring harmony. Where there is error, may we bring truth. Where there is doubt, may we bring faith. And where there is despair, may we bring hope. I will never negotiate with people who use coercion and violence to achieve their objective. 
They are the enemies of democracy. They are not interested in the future of democracy. They are trying to kill democracy for their own purposes. Go on, take your bloody pictures now! I must tell you that what we've got is an attempt to substitute the rule of the mob for the rule of law. And it was not succeed. using violence and intimidation to impose their will on others who do not want it. Thatcher's refusal to meet the union's demands devastated coal mining communities across Britain. Areas in the northeast, Wales and South Yorkshire are often regarded as having never recovered from Thatcher's policies. A controversial figure, even now, Margaret Thatcher divided opinion in Britain and yet remained as Prime Minister for 11 years. Indeed. Our job now, I think, is quite clear. We're going to unite, we're going to unite totally and absolutely, and we're going to win the next general election. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you all very much. My first task immediately... How do you feel, Mrs. My first, my first task immediately is to go and thank the enormous number of my parliamentary colleagues, friends and others who've been working in this campaign. Thank you all very much. Thank you all very much In 1990, Margaret Thatcher announced her resignation as leader of the Conservative Party. Six days later, John Major succeeded her in the role of Prime Minister. A less controversial figure, Major faced massive economic issues in the early 90s. High interest rates, falling house prices, and high unemployment rates made life challenging for the public and the government. As we come out of the recession, a large part of that borrowing requirement will disappear. As activity in the economy increases, tax yields will increase, some expenditures will fall away, and the borrowing gap will diminish quite dramatically. Unfortunately, the 1990s would not turn out to be a good decade for monarch nor prime minister. Nineteen ninety two proved to be a particularly troublesome year for both the royal family and the government. On the sixteenth of September, the pound sterling crashed. Britain was forced to withdraw from the European exchange rate mechanism, causing financial chaos. Hello, utter turmoil in the money markets. That's what dominates the news today. For the first time ever, the government has put up interest rates twice in one day. The new rate is 15%, the weapon with which the government will take on the currency dealers. For investors, it's good news. Mortgage holders will scarcely dare breathe. The big building societies have said they will try to hold off putting up rates until after the French vote on Sunday. The first rise of 2% came mid-morning, but that didn't stop pressure on the pound. So three hours later, another 3% rise to 15% to take effect from tomorrow. Uh, I was getting high. 30, 37. 30, 37. Oh, yeah, and suddenly just coming through. Has it moved? 80 figure.
a building in chaos for a policy in ruins. John Major arrived in Downing Street three hours ago, still with the builders there. The policy he conceived as Chancellor and carried out as Prime Minister in tatters. But it's the present Chancellor, Norman Lamont, who may be feeling the political heat most this morning. Yesterday, you backed Norman Lamont for what you called his speed and courage. Shouldn't you know now, though, have a fresh start with a fresh Chancellor? No, I shouldn't. And I'll tell you why not. Norman Lamont uh, was the Chancellor of the Exchequer, but the policy that Norman Lamont followed was my policy, the Cabinet's policy, all the Cabinet's policy, the policy we contested a general election on, the policy we won a general election on. Norman Lamont has followed that policy. He was overwhelmed by events. And I do not believe, because he was overwhelmed by events, doing what he promised he would do, seeking what he promised he would seek. Upon that basis, you cannot ask a man to leave a job he's been honourably doing and doing well. The event would later be named Black Wednesday. Nineteen ninety two is not a year on which I shall look back with undiluted pleasure. <clears throat> In the words of one of my more sympathetic correspondents, it has turned out to be an annus horribilis. For the Queen, the year would later be known as her annus horribilis. It was the year in which the rocky marriage between Charles and Diana became public knowledge with the release of the infamous Andrew Morton book. It was also the year Andrew and Fergie would separate, Anne and Mark would divorce, and her beloved Windsor Castle would set on fire. There can be no doubt, of course, that criticism is good for people and institutions that are part of public life. No institution, city, monarchy, whatever, should expect to be free from the scrutiny of those who give it their loyalty and support, not to mention those who don't. But we are all part of the same fabric of our national society, and that scrutiny by one part of another can be just as effective if it is made with a touch of gentleness, good humour and understanding. The Queen clearly warmed to John Major, appointing him as William and Harry's special guardian after the death of Princess Diana. Jennifer Nadel now reports on a remarkable Labour victory and what the future holds for the Conservatives. We will govern for the whole of this nation, every single part of it. A fresh era of British politics arrived in 1997 with a majority of 179 seats, Tony Blair's Labour Party ended 18 years of Conservative rule. A victorious Labour Prime Minister at the gates of Downing Street and a piece of political history. This was simply unprecedented. Tony and Cherie Blair walking up towards number 10, greeting jubilant party workers and some lucky members of the public allowed on this unique occasion to line the famous street. New Labour launched numerous changes to UK domestic policy, legalising civil partnerships, equality of age of consent, no matter one's sexual orientation, a minimum wage, increased devolution, and huge increases in spending on both health and education. What does your concept of radical really involve? It involves recognising that the basic principles of the Labour Party, which are about justice and progress, that's what the Labour Party should be about, that those principles should be applied in a different way to today's world. Back in 1945, when Clem Attlee and his government came in, they were a radical government in the sense that the way they thought to do it was to build up the state, nationalisation and so on. That's not the way for today's world. The way for today's world is education, skills, technology, developing small businesses, encouraging design and invention in Britain. It's a different role for government. It's a different relationship with industry. And it's a different attitude to the things that really matter. 
However, only three months into his office, Diana, Princess of Wales, was killed in a car crash in Paris. I feel like everyone else in this country today, utterly devastated. Our thoughts and prayers are with Princess Diana's family, in particular her two sons, the two boys. Our hearts go out to them. Though her own life was often sadly touched by tragedy, she touched the lives of so many others in Britain throughout the world with joy and with comfort. When with just a look or a gesture that spoke so much more than words, she would reveal to all of us the depth of her compassion and her humanity. The people everywhere, not just here in Britain, everywhere, they kept faith with Princess Diana. They liked her, they loved her. She was the people's princess. And that's how she will stay, how she will remain in our hearts and in our memories forever. It is widely reported that Tony Blair advised Queen Elizabeth to return to London from her summer retreat at Balmoral. Public opinion, led by an ever-hungry tabloid press, started to take a critical tone, personally attacking the Queen. So her Prime Minister appealed to her to take her place at Buckingham Palace to lead the nation in mourning. First, I want to pay tribute to Diana myself. She was an exceptional and gifted human being. In good times and bad, she never lost her capacity to smile and laugh, nor to inspire others with her warmth and kindness. Tonight at Kensington Palace, on the eve of a uniquely sad day, the people who love Diana are staging a final vigil. Today, we've had a national tragedy. Two airplanes have crashed into the World Trade Center in an apparent terrorist attack on our country. I have spoken to the vice president, to the governor of New York, and, the, and to conduct a full-scale investigation to hunt down and to find those folks who committed this act. Four years later, the world faced another shocking tragedy, 9-11. Hey, ITN News. Can you tell us... All I, all I want to, to, to say he, here now is just... Our profound sympathy, obviously, of course, with the people of, of New York, and as we know, there are many British people missing as well. We were just talking, the, the, the governor and the mayor and myself, a moment or two ago, about the need to stand together at this time. I, I, if you just forgive me, I'll say this, that I can only imagine what it must have been like for people in New York over these past nine days. But my father's generation knew what it was like. They went through the blitz. They know what it's like to suffer this type of tragedy and attack. And there was one country and one people that stood by us at that time. And that country was America, and those people were the American people. 
And as you stood side by side with us then, we stand side by side with you now. Your loss we count as our loss. Your struggle we take as our struggle. It means a great deal to the people of the city to, uh, to see the support that we have in Great Britain, throughout the world, and, and, and we know we share this loss with so many of your citizens. And I, I believe that we are much closer together than we've ever been before, much more united and much closer together. And I thank you very much, Mr. Prime Minister. In the wake of the incident, Blair agreed to support President George Bush Jr. and bring an end to the War on Terror. There was furious debate over the next year or so, and over two million people marched in opposition to Britain going into the Middle East conflict. A quarter of Labour MPs voted against the government decision to go to war with Iraq, but to no effect. On the 20th of March 2003, the war on Iraq began when US forces and their allies launched the first airstrikes on Baghdad. Blair stood for a third term in 2005, despite the cracks in his premiership having already been formed. I believe in a country where hard work and merit, not privilege or background, determine success. A country where Britain's families get the modern healthcare, education, childcare services they need, and on a fair and equal basis, it's a big decision. The British people are the boss, and they're the ones that will make it. Blair also faced growing unpopularity, and in June 2007, he bowed down to the pressure from his party, finally handing over the reins to Gordon Brown. I've been Prime Minister of this country for just over 10 years. In this job, in the world of today, I think that's long enough for me, but more especially for the country. And sometimes, the only way you conquer the pull of power, is to set it down. The former Chancellor of the Exchequer, Gordon Brown, succeeded Tony Blair as Prime Minister. I have just accepted the invitation of Her Majesty the Queen to form a government. This will be a new government with new priorities. And I have been privileged to have been granted the great opportunity to serve my country. A highly intelligent individual, Blair's right-hand man focused on growing the economy, implementing laws relating to health and climate change, and ending the UK's military operations in Iraq. Brown introduced neighborhood policing in every area, a legally enforceable right to early cancer screening and treatment, and the world's first ever Climate Change Act in 2008. I stand for a Britain that defends its citizens and both punishes crime and prevents it by dealing with the root causes. I stand for a Britain where because the earth is on loan from future generations, we must all be stewards of the environment. We must be givers as well as getters. Put something back and by doing so, make a difference. And this is my moral compass. This is who I am. I'm a conviction politician. I stand for a Britain where everyone should rise as far as the talents can take them. And then the talents of each of us should contribute to the well-being of all. However, the greatest difficulty of his time in office was the worldwide financial crash and the following recession. Brown strived to bring the country out of devastating economic crisis. This is a decisive uh, moment for the world economy. The decisions that we make now will affect our world for a decade or more to come. And people now recognize that this is a global crisis that requires a global solution. That's the reason why I've been speaking to other world leaders 
to build agreement on what we can do together to solve the problems. Uh, and that is why this is not a time for business as usual. If we are to solve the economic crisis and get our economies moving, then we need as a world community to take action together on a number of different fronts. In 2009, he hosted the G20 summit in London, where world leaders pledged to make an additional $1.1 trillion available to help the world economy and restore growth and jobs. Brown has often been criticized in the press for his financial policies during the recession. However, many world leaders turned to Brown for advice and guidance during the financial crash, showing his definite competency as a leader. So I say to you now, never stop believing in the good sense of the British people. Never stop believing we can move forward to a fairer, more responsible, more prosperous Britain. Never stop believing we can make a Britain equal to its best ideals. Never, never stop believing. And because the task is difficult, the triumph will be even greater. I want to make sure that my government always looks after the elderly, the frail, the poorest in our country. We must take everyone through us on some of the difficult decisions that we have ahead. Above all, it will be a government that is built on some clear values, values of freedom, values of fairness, and values of responsibility. David Cameron defeated Gordon Brown's Labour Party in the 2010 general election after forming a coalition government with the Liberal Democrats. Cameron entered office as the Queen's youngest Prime Minister and reportedly enjoyed a good relationship with the monarch. In this new world comes the reckoning for Labour's economic incompetence. The age of irresponsibility is giving way to an age of austerity. His premiership was marked by the ongoing effects of the 2008 financial crash and Cameron sought to reduce the large government deficit through austerity measures. Whole swathes of state activity can no longer be sacrosanct. The burden will be borne across the board. Cameron also legalized same-sex marriage in England and Wales. Marriage is a great institution and it should be there for people who are gay as well as people who aren't. That's why I've pioneered this change. I think it's important for our country, important for our society. Yes, it's about equality, but it's also about a stronger society. Queen Elizabeth II started her reign when homosexual acts were still considered illegal. The change in laws for same-sex marriage proved to be an historic moment for Great Britain. To fulfill his 2015 manifesto pledge, Cameron granted a referendum on the UK's membership of the EU. I'm the leader who is offering change in Europe, change in Britain's relationship with Europe, and then a referendum. And as I said to those people, and there are people in all parties, frankly, who would like to just simply leave Europe straight away, to those people, well, under my plan, they will at least get their chance to express their opinion in an in-out referendum. Is it better for Britain to remain in Europe as it currently is, or is there a way that we could actually get a better deal that was did more for British democracy, restored some control to the people of this country. That's the, that's the crucial thing for me. Leaving the European Union will be bad for growth, bad for our economy, bad for jobs and bad for families' finances. The Prime Minister advocated for the UK to remain in the European Union. However, a strong and on occasions misleading vote leave campaign succeeded in persuading the public vote in favour of Brexit on the 23rd of June 2016. David Cameron consequently offered his resignation to the Queen in the summer of 2016. In July 2016, Theresa May was elected Conservative Party leader and became the Queen's second female Prime Minister.
although having voted to remain, may took on the challenge of negotiating the UK's exit from the European Union. Those of us who do respect the result, whichever side of the question we stood on two years ago, need to come together now. If we don't, if we all go off in different directions in pursuit of our own visions of the perfect Brexit, we risk ending up with no Brexit at all. Brexit dominated her time as Prime Minister and May often faced criticism from both sides of the House of Commons and the media. Our new delivering Brexit was not going to be simple or straightforward. The result in 2016 was decisive, but it was close. The challenge of taking Brexit from the simplicity of the choice on the ballot paper to the complexity of resetting the country's relationship with 27 of its nearest neighbours was always going to be huge. A mere 4% difference between votes in the referendum meant the country was in political turmoil. Because it's Ow! Please! Ow! My Stop these traitors now! You'll be racist against the democratic wish of the people. All the English people You're outrageous. Devon for Europe! Devon for Europe! Come, come, come! Politicians and members of the public from all sides of the debate took to the streets to protest. The country and government was in a state of paralysis. Parliament rejected May's draft of withdrawal agreement three times during her premiership. Despite her efforts to negotiate, May stepped down as Prime Minister in 2019 to make way for the staunch Brexiteer, Boris Johnson. This is a country of aspiration and opportunity. And I hope that every young girl who has seen a woman prime minister now knows for sure that there are no limits to what they can achieve. I say to you that the hour is darkest before dawn and we can turn this thing round, and we can recover and we can win. The former mayor of London, Boris Johnson, strived into Downing Street with one major ambition, to get Brexit done. The doubters, the doomsters, the gloomsters, they are going to get it wrong again. The people who bet against Britain are going to lose their shirts because we're going to restore trust in our democracy. Johnson appointed the controversial figure Dominic Cummings as his senior advisor and pushed and pushed for the UK to leave the EU, with or without a deal, on the 31st of October 2019. Do we want 2020 to be another year of defeatism and despair? No, we don't. Get Brexit done. On the 28th of August 2019, Johnson sparked a political controversy. He requested for the Queen to prorogue Parliament from the 10th of September. This was to narrow the window in which Parliament could block a no-deal Brexit. However, the Supreme Court felt that Johnson had misled the Queen, so his advice and the subsequent prorogation was unlawful. Each opinion expresses the view that the advice given by the government to Her Majesty the Queen to prorogue Parliament from 9th September to 14th October was unlawful and that therefore the prorogation itself is unlawful. Johnson was forced to apologise to the Queen. In December 2019, Johnson called a general election. His slogan, Get Brexit Done, was the battle cry of his campaign and a weary British public agreed with the sentiment. The Conservatives, led by Johnson, won a significant victory with a majority of 80 seats. He asked for a mandate to get Brexit done, and he got it. 
Boris Johnson arriving back in Downing Street this morning with girlfriend Carrie Simmons. His gamble on a Christmas election had paid off, and how? The signing of the Brexit deal took place in January 2020, and the UK officially left the EU on the 31st of January 2020. From this evening, I must give the British people a very simple instruction. You must stay at home. On the 23rd of March 2020, Prime Minister Boris Johnson announced the UK would go into lockdown. Cases of a new virus began emerging in Wuhan, China. Concerns in Britain grew when cases of coronavirus in Italy shot up rapidly. Johnson would face another crisis, this time on a worldwide scale. While we mourn every death, the average daily death rate continues steadily to fall. This progress is testament to the phenomenal efforts of our NHS and social care staff working tirelessly on the front line. And it has only been possible thanks to the character and fortitude with which you, the British people, have made fundamental changes to the way you all live and work. The next 18 months were not easy for the British public. Under such pressure, the NHS and social care system massively struggled. The government and Boris Johnson are still majorly criticised for their slow decisions and negligence at such a critical time. On the 9th of April 2021, Prince Philip, the Queen's dear husband of 73 years, died. It was with great sadness that a short time ago I received word from Buckingham Palace that His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh has passed away at the age of 99. His passing was a terrible loss to the Queen and the country. Due to the COVID-19 restrictions, only 30 people were allowed to attend his funeral. A leader by example, the Queen suffered that loss and followed the same rules as everyone else. Unfortunately, it would later be revealed that Downing Street had not been entirely following the rules with quite the same dedication. Partygate covered the news. Johnson denied everything until more and more evidence surfaced. It was revealed that the night before Prince Philip's funeral, a party took place at 10 Downing Street. The heart-wrenching images of the Queen, pictured alone wearing her face mask, began to garner waves of public anger towards Johnson's betrayal. I, I, I deeply and, and bitterly regret uh, that, 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 that that happened, and I can only uh, you know, and renew my apologies both to, uh, to Her Majesty and uh, to the country. Johnson went on to publicly apologise to the Queen. However, it was the beginning of the end for Johnson's premiership. After a summer of mass resignations from within his own party, Johnson resigned as Prime Minister on the 5th of July, 2022. In only a couple of hours, I will be in Balmoral, 
to see Her Majesty the Queen. And the torch will finally be passed to a new Conservative leader. The baton will be handed over in what has unexpectedly turned out to be a relay race. They changed the rules halfway through, but never mind that now. And through that lacquered black door, a new Prime Minister will shortly go to meet a fantastic group of public servants. Our country was built by people who get things done. We have huge reserves of talent, of energy and determination. I am confident that together we can ride out the storm. We can rebuild our economy and we can become the modern, brilliant Britain that I know we can be. After three prime ministers in six years, it was now Liz Truss's turn to enter the doors of 10 Downing Street. Truss proved victorious in the Conservative campaign against Rishi Sunak, vowing to cut taxes and get a grip of the economy during the cost of living crisis. Truss travelled to Balmoral to gain the Queen's permission to form a government under her name. Prime Ministers are more commonly appointed at Buckingham Palace, the monarch's main residence. However, it was later reported that the Queen was suffering from mobility issues and the palace required the new Prime Minister to travel to Her Majesty's Balmoral residence instead. Little did we know, however, that Liz Trust would be the Queen's final Prime Minister so soon. Two days after Liz Truss's appointment, Queen Elizabeth II passed away at Balmoral on the 8th of September 2022. With the passing of the second Elizabethan age, we usher in a new era in the magnificent history of our great country, exactly as Her Majesty would have wished, by saying the words, God save the King. A wave of emotion spread across the world, and Truss would now lead the country into a period of mourning. In the early years of her reign, the Queen oversaw a political world dominated by men. However, as the years progressed, the dutiful monarch witnessed vast changes to British society and the arrival of three female prime ministers at the door of 10 Downing Street. Right until the end, Queen Elizabeth II fulfilled her sovereign duty and continued to present a calming presence during a time of upheaval and uncertainty for British politics. She always made it clear that no matter how bad things might look or feel, she'd seen worse and she knew that the country was strong enough to come through it well. And so in a way, if the job of the prime minister is really to fortify the, the people of the country with that knowledge, the prime minister sometimes gets that strength and that conviction from the queen. Her Majesty's living prime ministers all attended the grand state funeral in Westminster Abbey to pay their respects. Several ex-Prime Ministers also made speeches in the House of Commons, reflecting on their time with the great monarch at weekly audiences and social occasions at Balmoral. I remember one picnic at Balmoral which was taking place in one of the bosses on the estate. The hampers came from the castle and we all mucked in to put the food and drink out on the table. I picked up some cheese, put it on a plate and was transferring it to the table. The cheese fell on the floor. <laughs> I had a split-second decision to make. <laughs> I picked up the cheese, put it on the plate and put it on the table. 
Queen Elizabeth II's devotion to her beloved country can be defined through her unwavering personal support to each and every Prime Minister throughout her reign. There is no doubt that King Charles III will adopt his beloved mother's keen interest in political events and continue to fulfill his duty as the new sovereign.